Welcome to the Korean Hat Podcast. I'm your host, Jed Lee Henry, and on today's show, we have Lee Seong Hyun. Seong Hyun is the director of the Center for Chinese Studies at the Sejong Institute in Seoul, as well as being the former director for the Department of Unification Studies. And he focuses a lot of his research around the current relationship between China under Xi Jinping and the Korean Peninsula. This is one of those relationships that's at the fore today, under the current American-China trade war, and of course, the security implications arising from North Korea. And these events are having a significant impact. China's trade has dropped since the onset of the trade war. And China's relationship with America, as well as South Korea, has ebbed and flowed as the various diplomatic discussions with North Korea have come and gone. And on this latter topic, the thinking is that China is desperate to maintain their regional control and keep the Korean Peninsula as much as possible under its sphere of influence. In response to the various Kim Trump summits, China were quick to reassert their influence over the region and of course over Kim Jong-un hosting a series of rapid-fire summits of their own. This for many was a statement not just that China has a close relationship with North Korea, but a fear that China were being cut out of the negotiation process. They were losing regional influence, and they were running the risk that Kim Jong-un might steer the future of his country away from them and towards perhaps America. And moments like this are not just seen through the current lens, even with the current leader Xi Jinping, but seen from a historical perspective. This is a rebuilding, re-emerging Chinese nation that is playing a strategic long game here and one in which they may occasionally compromise, they may occasionally back down, but for which their grand plans will and cannot be sacrificed. China wants to be the dominant power in Southeast Asia. And so when South Korea and America hold joint military exercises or America plants high-level military equipment inside South Korea, such as the THAAD missile defense system, China's instinct is to see this not as a defense against North Korea, but also a way of pegging them in, a way of limiting their ambition and reasserting American military alliances across the region, which is why the North Korean issue is so important for them, especially if they can control it in such a way that any deal will have to come through them, that without Chinese cooperation, the issue will spiral back into brinksmanship, missile launches, and even nuclear tests. The Chinese attitude towards Korea is perhaps one of exclusion anxiety. It is happy in the role of mediator because it is a position from which they can influence and control the flow of events. And this boils down to even things such as the end of war declaration between the two Koreas. China, as a previous party to the Korean War, insists that this has to come through them as well. And of course have a natural fear of what such a declaration might mean for themselves. But from the other side, looming over all of these talks and all of these issues around the Korean Peninsula is opportunity for China. Something as worrying as an end of war declaration and a peace treaty might also be an opportunity for China to finally say to America, you no longer need to base your troops in South Korea. And from there make the claim that any continuing base without the North Korean threat is in fact a target upon China and not North Korea. And it is this balance between threat risk and opportunity that Seong Hoon is going to talk us through today. Now, as always, this podcast is entirely funded by you, the listener. And if you do want it to continue, please consider donating at the Patreon account or the PayPal link attached below. Or alternatively, simply share, like, or comment on this podcast across social media. All the help is greatly appreciated. On that, and to talk us through China's strategy on the Korean Peninsula under Xi Jinping, this is Lee Seong Hoon. Song Hun, thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Jed. So we're going to be talking through at least China's strategy and China's strategy for the Korean Peninsula. But of course, a lot of this revolves around America and their role in this. So Mm -hmm. it might be a good way to start with the relationship, the current relationship between China and America and the issue of the trade war at the moment. So how do you see this unfold in this idea? Because in many people's estimation, this is a real risk to peace and stability. And I've read through some of your research that there is an aspect of this, that the one great stabilizer in all this trade uh, is being jeopardized. Well, I think there is a myth that when it comes to U.S.-China relations that these are two huge giant superpowers and they are too big to fight because when they fight each other and they both lose and uh, they both are nuclear powers, uh, huge uh, nuclear stockpiles. 
and uh, they are too big and important and uh, mutually dependent, have a complementary relationship. Uh, some even say that they are now uh, so-called formed G2 group of two nations. You know, we, we have a G7, but now the world have entered a G2, a core global governance by U.S. and China. That kind of uh, gives a credit to China's rise and importance of China in international governance. But I think this is ultimately a myth uh, because China has never declared that as it uh, progresses and develops, it would become one of the uh, democracy uh, camps. It, it has never said so even though that has been an expectation from the Bill Clinton administration that if we economically engage China, then over the years, China will become more and more like one of us and China's human rights, China's governance, China's government system, freedom of the press, social structure, human rights, they all would uh, improve and Chinese people travel more and more uh, other countries and uh, find out what the situations are outside of China, outside the bamboo curtain, and the world will be peaceful and become one. And that will be the what Francis Fukuyama said, the end of the history. Uh, I think that is uh, a little bit uh, lopsided in a way it reflects the wishful thinking uh, from the, what I call a uh, democracy camp. I lived in Beijing for 11 years. I have never felt that way. Uh, I have never felt that it was going in that direction, particularly for the last seven or so years under the Xi Jinping administration. Having said that, going back to your original, uh, uh, your earlier uh, uh, mentioning about the importance of trade. U.S. and China are two very different countries in terms of ideology, worldview, political structure, uh, the way uh, the ordinary people perceive their governments and what governments are supposed to do. Um, it's easy to conclude that, oh, the Chinese people will also want democracy and they also uh, wish to have a, each individual a voting right, just like in you know, any other country. That is more or less correct, but then I think there is a nuance, the differences, and also there has been a, a Communist Party indoctrination about how uh, you know, the U.S. or the West has been using uh, economic engagement with China as a uh, prelude to, prelude to uh, so-called the color revolution. Uh, and they have been, uh, you know, the Chinese people have been very well educated about it, having a, a sense of a guarding against it. Uh, so for the last 40 years, uh, you know, trade, uh, has been, in a way, functioned as a stabilizer between the U.S. and China. Uh, they benefit from doing uh, trade with each other so that uh, both sides, particularly from the American side, has largely uh, ignored other important areas of disagreement, such as human rights and political system and ideology. But then, for the last few years, uh, this trade, which has been functioned as a stabilizer of the U.S.-China relations, has been, uh, in a way, uh, toppled. And we see a uh, crack in the wall. And when the stabilizer is being toppled, then all the dormant uh, issues of the problems that I just mentioned uh, are also... Uh, uh, coming to the fore, and that's why many people are now beginning to awaken the reality that this is not just a trade war, but about uh, ideology, uh, world views, or even uh, uh, in a war of uh, different civilizations, which some people uh, uh, criticize as an overstatement, but 
from my uh, limited or uh, subjective sense of uh, uh, experience of living in China for 11 years, uh, I think that uh, simplification of uh, the relationship or conflict nature of the conflict between U.S. and China as a class of a civilization. Mm, I may be a pessimist, but then I think that that more or less largely captures the overall spirit and nature of the conflict between China and the United States. Having said that, I think uh, we also uh, tend to look at how North Korea fits into this U.S.-China relations. Just like the trade functioned as a stabilizer in the U.S.-China economic relations, it's very interesting and uh, many people don't point out, but um, uh, U.S. and China relations, uh, North Korean issue has been a mm, not not quite stabilizer, but a common area of cooperation. Both China and Washington, United States have identified as an area for cooperation because both the U.S. and China want denuclearization of North Korea. So whenever U.S. leader meets with a Chinese leader, whenever Trump meets with uh, Xi Jinping, the issue of North Korea uh, has been always mentioned in Malalago, in Buenos Aires G20 summit. Uh, it's very interesting to watch when they meet for G20 summit and issues uh, more or less trade disputes. But then if you look at the White House statement, there are three paragraphs, and one paragraph is also touches upon North Korea in that meeting, which was supposed to touch upon trade. What that means is that, from my interpretation, that uh, U.S. and China uh, have very little to agree with, so that they uh, front load, uh, uh, you know, North Korea to package in a way and uh, as a PR package to show to the global audience because they cannot tell them that Xi Jinping and I met and that we have not produced any concrete agreement so that they front load the North Korean issue as, oh, this is what we have agreed to cooperate with each other. Uh, so uh, because China and U.S. have very little area of cooperation in a way, uh, North Korea has been uh, functioned as a stabilizer in political or diplomatic area, just like trade has functioned as a stabilizer in the economic realm in the well, U.S.-China relations. Well, let's uh, go back to that economic issue then and that trade issue, because I've seen through a lot of your research and a lot of your online talks and lectures that uh, people tend to misunderstand China in this. So you've made relevance here that you've had references and stuff saying that China's growth has indeed dipped as a result of this trade war with America. And in fact, it's dipped to its lowest rate in over to, uh, almost 30 years. But inside China, this hasn't had the sort of hard impact in, on people and on morale that people would expect. So you've, you've done a lot of research and looked into the propaganda that China have used in response to this trade war. And this is quite telling and will have import for the North Korean and South Korean situation as well, that China have used this as a moment, an example in which they can try to, to claim and seize the initiative and say, we have arrived, we are a great power in the world. And you look at uh, Huawei and the recent problems that they've had, and you said that um, People tend to misunderstand this. Huawei had already given up on the American market. It had made a decision to target the European market, and it was already almost like a Chinese national statement that we are ready to stand alone. We don't need to worry about these things. And a little bit of pain is nothing because this is the, the grand model of a rising dominant China. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we have to give China uh, due credit as descendants of the 
art of war and strategy going back um, 2,500 years ago. And they still uh, ha have that strategic thinking. And when it comes to Huawei, uh, you know, when I do interviews and the conduct research in, in inside China, I think when China officially says something, and that is just only one option, uh, actually they have prepared other options at the same time. And they are ready to deal with uh, the situations when the proposed option does not work. And I think this is open what outsiders neglect. Uh, and I think that uh, the Chinese side uh, dispatched in the last year groups of uh, uh, investigation uh, teams and delegations, including scholars and journalists, to Washington, D.C., and New York, and sat down with the uh, American think tanks, scholars, retired diplomats. And at that time, China also made a mistake initially that this is just uh, one of the usual trade disputes and American side just, you know, just, you know, feel bad that, you know, their economy is not doing very well. And if Chinese side buys more American stuff uh, and give uh, some benefits uh, in trade to the uh, Trump, then Trump being a businessman, he would be satisfied. So Trump was playing domestic politics using the trade disputes with China, particularly the uh, midterm elections was approaching last year, uh, uh, November last year. So Chinese side also had a, uh, you know, underestimated the significance of the dispute, but then when they dispatched uh, people to the United States and had uh, a, a small uh, seminars and uh, workshops and they realized the situation is quite uh, serious. And then, as you know, there was a speech, famous speech by the vice president, um, uh, Mike Pence at the Hudson Institution Institute, and also some of the hardline uh, remarks, and also uh, recently uh, the remark by the head of the U.S. State Department planning uh, uh, department that uh, this is a class of civilization. Chinese side uh, paid quite an uh, attention to these remarks as a signals and signs that uh, how the U.S. is uh, uh, planning or strategizing uh, in the ongoing uh, trade disputes and uh, future relations uh, between U.S. and China. And now uh, it has been, I think, it's coming into this year, or probably at the end of last year, I think China has been planning on a mid-term and long-term uh, competition and stalemate uh, rivalry with the United States. So uh, my sense is that China is ready. And uh, even if they, it, it's very in interesting to watch the sudden attitude change of Huawei Huawei used to keep a very low, low profile when Meng Wanzhou, the daughter of uh, founder of Huawei, was arrested in Canada. Uh, but then uh, early this year, suddenly Huawei changed it from a, a humble, what I call a humble mode to a confrontative mode against the United States, even sued the U.S. government for blocking Huawei in uh, the U.S. market. Uh, that is, uh, the, I think, this, uh, quite a, a blatant signal that Huawei is engaging in a strategy of a public uh, PR war against United States. Because 
Huawei is willing to give up its market in the United States because anyway, the U.S. will not give a, a space for Huawei. So by engaging in open PR war and open criticism uh, against the United States as an unfair player, not China is not an unfair player, but they describe it as the U.S. as an unfair player, and they market this narrative to in other parts of the world, except for the United States, because other parts of the world, such as Europe, is also a big uh, 5G market, and they have not completely excluded Huawei yet. They are still in uh, decision uh, mode, what to do about Huawei. Uh, so Huawei, by engaging in a public criticism as a U.S. as a unfair trade uh, actor, Huawei is uh, wooing the uh, you know, European market, uh, hoping the European market will adopt Huawei or uh, work with Huawei. Huawei has been already working for the last 20 years with the Southeast Asian countries. So Southeast Asian countries are hard to change their relationship uh, away from Huawei. China is also deepening its uh, long-term Asian ally, that is Japan. Uh, you can see that Japan and China have been deepening, warming up their relations after seven-year hiatus of a diplomatic almost chill. It was China's initiative after seven years of treating Japan as a stranger, but suddenly uh, they are warming up to each other because uh, you know, even though they are rivals, arch rivals in history, Japan and China, but China uh, at this time, uh, you know, needs Japan uh, to find Japan as useful uh, as a counterweight uh, against uh, 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 United States, or at least China doesn't want to, uh, uh, you know, alienate Japan as, or uh, Japan being an adversary to the China. So. And mm, so this has a lot of relevance for the Korean Peninsula here. And before we open up a lot of the deep issues here, I might get you to touch on something. So you, you've said it a couple of times there, this conflict between China and America. And uh, it has a historical element to it that is very important for the, both Koreas, North and South. And that is this idea that at least in the recent history, there is a memory in some ways of uh, this 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 feeling that when South Korea doesn't pay attention and North Korea, of course, when they don't pay attention to the shift in diplomatic landscape and geopolitical changes, then they are the ones that lose out. And this historically happened with issues over Japan and annexation and things like this. So uh, and this, of course, comes back to that phrase that everyone knows, the idea of shrimp between whales. So I might get open up that historical issue and that idea that um, Korea uh, both Koreas are paying very close attention to these sort of battles between the major powers around their around their peninsula. I think uh, Korea should pay a lot more attention than what they do right now. Unfortunately, uh, at least the South Korea and North Korea, they have been preoccupied with the inter-Korean relations and nuclear negotiation for the last two years since the uh, Moon Jae-in, two years ago when the Moon Jae-in government uh, started. And their whole uh, foreign policy or diplomacy effort has been solely focused on North Korean issue and mediating relations between North Korea and the United States. So uh, they have not been paying adequate attention to this uh, uh, more or less the, uh, bigger uh, conflict or canopy the conflict between the United States and China, that kind of uh, is a bigger setting. Uh, when U.S. and China, they tend to look at the North Korean issue as a, in the big picture of uh, their own bilateral relations between U.S. and China conflict and their influence in East Asia. So from my sense is that North Korean nuclear issue itself is important, but then for bigger uh, superpowers like United States and China, they treat the North Korean issue in the, uh, they also factor that into account how that benefits 
their strategic position against China or against the United States and their sphere of influence in East Asia. And uh, South Korea and, you know, has not been paying very well good uh, amount of attention to it because it has been preoccupied with North Korean issue. And historically, you know, in 1592, at the time, the Japanese warrior uh, general called uh, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, he told uh, Korea that I need to borrow uh, pass through the you know Korean Peninsula on my way to punish China, on my way to uh, wage a war against China. All I need to do is uh, I need to pass through the Korean Peninsula because Korean Peninsula is located between Japan and then China. Which all I you know ask is just you know let us pass through our soldiers pass through. But uh, you know, everyone knows that this is just an you know, excuse to you know, in, in invade the you know, Korean Peninsula. And uh, of course, the Korean king at that time refused the Japanese uh, demand. And no wonder the Japan uh, invaded Korean Peninsula uh, starting the seven year long Imjin War. So uh, in the historically, in the rivalry of neighboring uh, big powers, South Korea and uh, North Korea at the same time, uh, Korean Peninsula as a whole ha has been a victim of a big power rivalry, particularly uh, during the power transition period. For example, when the, the structure or landscape of uh, hegemony uh, surrounding the Korean Peninsula changes, such as for example, right now, the China is rising and challenging the status of the United States. This is what, uh, you know, IR scholars call the power transition period, China challenging the leadership of the United States. And the historical, you know, examinations and the documents all uh, teaches South Koreans that this is a very vulnerable, vulnerable period uh, for Koreans and uh, we, Koreans, even you know, President Lo Muhyun, uh, the former President Lo Muhyun, told George W. Bush during their summit that uh, Korea has been invaded by big power rivalry and big powers directly more than 900 times in their history. So that's why I think Koreans pay very keen attention to the big power uh, competition rivalry uh, surrounding the Korean Peninsula. So. On that question about the big power rivalry and the fact that the first thing you said there is that Korea is not paying enough attention to the rivalry and indeed uh, China's role in this. And that has shown out through the recent diplomacy, the summit talks and the talks about denuclearization and the talks about end of war declarations. And these have always been spoken about in trilateral terms. This is North Korea, South Korea and America. And South Korea, of course, have been pushing recently to return to talks. But the talks that they're often speaking about is America and North Korea speaking directly. And in from what you've written through a lot of your research, this is one of the problems. This is an isolation of China. And China don't just see this as a regional issue, but they see themselves as both parties to the Korean War and therefore parties to the end of the Korean War. And um, you mentioned a few times as well that um, Donald Trump complained recently, he always complains publicly and he did so publicly, that whenever um, Kim he seems a bit reticent to follow through on, on, on details of discussions, he believes that China is behind this. So I might get you to open up the idea of China's influence here and the fear in China of being isolated from negotiations about the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Well, this is uh, an interest, in, in, interesting question, and uh, also uh, we can delve into this question for hours and <laughs> hours, <laughs> because this is uh, usually the area where I do research and there are so many details. Um, uh, but I think that uh, for this uh, you know, audience, let me put it this way. Um, I think uh, it was a meaningful shift of strategy on the part of the United States in the 26-year uh, negotiation with North Korea that for the first time, uh, U.S. bypassed China to directly reach out to North Korea. 
Uh, the usual narrative surrounding North Korea is that you know North Korea is China's issue, so that China should fix it. China owns North Korea. If China teams up, cooperates with the United States, then the North Korean nuclear issue could be solved. I think the Trump administration uh, initially approached it, and then later shifted it. Uh, Trump administration tr uh, began to bypass China. Uh, the first occasion was the Singapore summit. Uh, it made China very anxious because China was not present in Singapore. And when Trump and Kim Jong-un disappeared uh, behind their uh, room, behind the scene uh, to have their uh, off-the-record session, China got very anxious because China uh, wants to know what Trump and Kim were discussing. And this is so-called China's anxiety. China's anxiety has a reason uh, for that because in private conversations, and some of them are actually, uh, you know, now diplomatically open source of, uh, you know, uh, that you could, you could read from on the internet as well. Uh, North Korea, interestingly, even though they, uh, their guardian has been China, but North Korea has been wooing the United States. Uh, for the last 26 years. And North Korea uh, negotiators, even very top-level uh, officials such as Kim Jong-un, the Workers' Party International Department uh, Secretary, who was uh, sent by uh, North Korean leadership to meet with the Arnold Cantor, uh, U.S. State Department senior official in 1991 uh, in the United States. He told the American side that if America establish diplomatic relations with North Korea, normalize relations with you know, the two countries, normalize relations, then North Korea will allow the continued presence of U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula because North Korea also perceives uh, U.S. troops as a stabilizer. Uh, check against the uh, rising influence of China. And uh, North Korea would also uh, 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 even say that uh, they will become an ally of the United <laughs> States. You know, we know that you know, North Korea is an ally of China. <laughs> Actually, uh, North Korea is the only official ally of China. Uh, China has not discontinued, discontinued its uh, alliance with North Korea, even though it discontinued its alliance with the Soviet Union in 1980. So whether whatever people talk about, uh, debate about the nature of a North Korea-China relationship, they are still allies. Uh, but then North Korean official is telling to the United States that now we will, if we improve our relations and if we have diplomatic relations, then I will become your ally. That means that North Korea is ditching China and defect to the U.S. camp. This is what China very much worried during the Singapore summit. What if Kim Jong-un uh, proposed a deal to the United States? And, uh, you know, those kind of things. So when China is being passed or China is sidelined in the discussion about North Korean issue and China was not present, but, uh, you know, North Korea and the United States, they have their own bilateral uh, in-depth discussion. It kind of triggers China's uh, fear response uh, that what if North Korea uh, defect the U.S. camp. Particularly, this is relevant at this moment because uh, the U.S.-China conflict is deepening, and uh, uh, people are talking about Cold War, and uh, people are also talking about groupings, just like the, during the Cold War era, one camp is the U.S. camp, and the, the other camp is the China camp. During the Cold War era, when U.S. and Soviet Union, uh, they uh, divided the, the world countries uh, between the Soviet camp and the U.S. camp. 
And finally, I think that um, mm, it's, uh, it was a meaningful strategy, uh, as I mentioned, that uh, for shift of strategy for the United States to bypass China. But then, uh, unfortunate thing, there was a downside that particularly the collapse of the, uh, the Hanoi summit. Uh, even though it is a bilateral negotiation, but South Korea played a mediating role. And if you remember, it was actually South Korean spy chip who visited Pyongyang, met with Kim Jong-un, and Kim Jong-un told that his willingness to give up nuclear weapons. That started this uh, denuclearization negotiation that we have witnessed uh, for the last uh, over one year. So South Korea is a party uh, to this uh, U.S.-North Korea relations and negotiations, uh, uh, functioning as a, a mediator. But when Trump walked away uh, from uh, the Hanoi uh, uh, summit, uh, then suddenly uh, the South Korea was left with no options because uh, U.S. did not give any uh, maneuvering room to President Moon Jae-in. Uh, Moon Jae-in uh, invested so much on improving relations with North Korea, helping the relations between United States and North Korea. But when Trump walked away, probably Trump was only thinking about the, his interest, but he left uh, Moon Jae-in in the cold. And the North Korea is, uh, after the collapse of Hanoi, North Korea is upset. And North Korea has been uh, unwilling to uh, uh, you know, continue its uh, improving relations with South Korea either. Uh, so South Korea was actually a collateral damage uh, when it invested so much on improving uh, the situation, uh, North Korean denuclearization and improving inter-Korean relations. But then uh, collapse of the you know, Hanoi summit, South Korea suddenly became the uh, collateral damage. And I think uh, if United States and South Korea are allies, and uh, if South Korea had functioned as a mediator between uh, the relationship between uh, 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 you know, Trump and Kim Jong-un. I think before Trump walked away from Hanoi summit, uh, she should have talk, uh, thought about how it might have impact uh, the, uh, the position of South Korea. That was a kind of a, a missing point uh, debate that I have not been hearing uh, so far. And there's a significant uh, cultural question here that you've touched on in your research that I don't see many other people touching on. And that is when Trump left this negotiation with Kim in the Hanoi summit, he left half an hour before dinner. And of course, this is a lunch, a, a lunch. lunch, lunch, sorry, yes. And of course, this is a, a big cultural no-no. This is a huge insult. And when we contrast this with the behavior of Xi Jinping, whenever he's had meetings with Kim, he has gone out of his way to do things like invite Kim's wife and have their wives meet. <laughs> and he, he's, he's trying the opposite. So I guess my question here is, uh, how do you see the relationship between Xi Jinping and Kim Jong-un? Is, uh, is Xi Jinping simply uh, once again sending a message to the world as in, if you want to deal with the Korean Peninsula, you must deal through me. Or is or is she seeing something of progress he may be able to get from Kim Jong-un here? And of course, you've mentioned a few times that Xi Jinping recently has been talking about the importance that both countries are socialist countries and the idea that both are moving in the same direction, if even if there is some difference here. Well, um, Xi Jinping is an unusual Chinese leader uh, for uh, because he truly uh, believes in socialism in the 21st century. He is not a pretender, but he's a true believer of uh, uh, Leninism and socialism. And in Northeast Asia, uh, there is another socialist country that is North Korea. People don't normally uh, discuss these issues, but there is, you know, if North Korea is gone or defect to U.S. side, uh, you know, China 
will be left as the only socialist country in Northeast Asia that will have a psychological impact on China and Chinese people. You don't want to be alone in this world, in your neighborhood. Uh, people, I think, China, China observers in the West, they tend to uh, ignore, underestimate this psychological uh, uh, issue component. Uh, for that matter, uh, Xi Jinping wants to strengthen uh, the socialist uh, bonding with North Korea. So when you see the the four, you know, they Xi Jinping and Kim Jong Un met four times, and when you see their summit, there is a continuing, uh, consistent theme of uh, strengthening socialist bonding between the two. And I think this reflects a Chinese strategy uh, to keep North Korea on. Chinese side, particularly at this time of deepening relation uh, conflict with the United States. And I think that also indicates the limitation of cooperation between United States and China on North Korean issue, even though they both want denuclearization of North Korea. And they think that they have areas of cooperation but I think uh, the U.S. side tends to overestimate China's willingness or eagerness to see uh, how much how much China is willing to push uh, North Korea to give them nuclear weapons. It is a uh, quite a priority for Washington, but for China, it is not the most important priority for North Korea to denuclearization. For China, the important priority is to prevent the collapse of North Korea, remain, North Korea remain uh, as a socialist country. And that is a uh, much more important priority. Also, having another socialist uh, in their neighborhood, in the uh, uh, conflict or uh, rivalry with the United States. So uh, from for years, I was a, a skeptic uh, and uh, have been pointing out the limitation of cooperation between China and the United States. But I think that U.S. Uh, scholars, including uh, some of the diplomats who negotiated with the Chinese, they point out that China also wants denuclearization because China doesn't, if North Korea owns nuclear weapons, they argue, South Korea will also try to get nuclear weapons. If that is the case, then Japan will definitely will also want to have uh, nuclear weapons. In that case, there will be a nuclear domino uh, effect in Northeast Asia, which is a nightmare for China. So they use this uh, narrative uh, to justify the willingness on the side of China in terms of denuclearization. But I think uh, this is, yes, that's true. But I think that there is a subtlety and degree of how much China puts that as an important factor. I think uh, the U.S. has overestimated uh, this factor, I think this is, you know, sense that uh, strategic miscalculation that also indicates how much uh, we we still don't know much about China. <laughs> in a way, I'm, 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 you know, I have been struggling, uh, even though I lived in, in Beijing for 11 years. There are some other people who lived in China for 24 years or 30 years or even 40 years for. Uh, you know, we all have to be humble when it comes to, you know, studying China. China is still a black box and uh, we are all grouping, on the, you know, like we are grouping on the elephant. Uh, <laughs> China is still uh, very hard to know. So we only, that's why we need to cooperate among China scholars to, um, you know, to uh, get the uh, puzzle correct. However, looking in at that black box, there is one question that uh, is, at least it seems theoretically quite plausible here. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about an end of war de declaration. And of course, China were a party, not just to the Korean War, but also the armistice. So as that war hasn't ended, China is still technically at war with the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And um, there are a lot of talk about this ending. And uh, you have put through some of your work here, and I've read other people giving this sort of treatment as well. This idea that 
uh, this is incredibly important for China. Not, it, it's one of those things that uh, at least comes forward as something that China may not want. But it's something that may be in their interest here because, of course, once the end of war declaration is finished, once they have this signed off, China's next step might be and likely would be to then mention to America there's no need for your troops to be in South Korea any, anymore. And importantly, there's no need for you to have regular war games. And, of course, the THAAD defense system that is in South Korea, that could be removed also. And you've put through a lot of your work here just how it seems to be incredibly upset to the North Koreans whenever South Korea and America have their, have their war drills. But, of course, it is also incredibly uh, nerve-wracking for the Chinese. They have a similar reticence to it. They don't like it either. And their response to the import of the THAAD uh, missile defense system was incredibly strong. They put economic <laughs> sanctions on, on, um, on South Korea, and uh, they even did uh, some uh, flights through with their aircraft along the South Korean uh, uh, um, air defense zone. So um, I might yet open up that idea, this, this risk for America, that when they do come about to, to sign an a, a end-of-war declaration, that this might have a lot of import down the line that would benefit China in the long run. I think you very eloquently uh, summarized the complexity of the matter uh, better than, you know, me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, and I think this also touches upon very little discussed the matter, that is the lack of uh, trust between uh, China and the United States. This is the very sorry state between you know, U.S. and China they lack strategic trust between each other in their own strategy in East Asia. And that's why I, it's also the same as between North Korea and the United States. The U.S. demands North Korea give up nuclear weapons or nuclear programs to a significant degree first, while North Korea demands U.S. lift sanctions first. You do it first. You do it first. Why they do that? Because they don't trust the other side. And I think China and the United States also don't trust uh, the day after signing a peace treaty on the Korean Peninsula. U.S. worries that you know China's next step, you know, will be demand the uh, withdrawal of U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula because there is a peace on the Korean Peninsula theoretically. And why do you still keep your troops on the Korean Peninsula when there is a peace now we have achieved, other than the reason that you, that is aiming at China. So if you want to prove that you are not, a, you know, you don't have any adversarial intention against China, you should withdraw troops from the Korean Peninsula after the peace treaty. And uh, I think these are the realm of uh, strategic uh, uh, lack of strategic trust between China and the United States. And unfortunately, uh, with the relationship between U.S. and China are, is deteriorating, as we all notice. So uh, I think it, uh, you know, the situation is not very ideal. And uh, in all matters in the human realm, I think uh, there is so-called a window of opportunity. And uh, when, like, let's say that, you know, even like seven years ago during the Obama administration, that was a, a you know, rather at the time, people, the people to Asia started, that was rather, a, a, you know, rather, uh, you know, okay, a good period uh, that, that thinking about, you know, global governance and climate change uh, when U.S. and China uh, thinking about, uh, uh, joint global governance and the uh, U.S. also needs Chinese cooperation. China should put more effort in these e matters that we could work together. We are G2. Uh, I think cooperation was a prevailing uh, theme that scholars were proposing at the time. So at that time, if we also, when that time, when the U.S.-China relationship was good, and when that was a window opportunity, and when U.S. and China also dealt with the uh, North Korean issue at the time, probably it was much more easier to solve North Korean issue at the time. But right now, U.S. and China relations are deteriorating. 
Uh, there is a lack of trust between U.S. and China on North Korean issue. Uh, and so I think uh, uh, we are, uh, I think uh, I'm afraid that we are losing a window opportunity to solve a, one, of, one of the uh, most uh, 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 profoundly important global issue that is North Korea nuclear issue. Uh, if the uh, stalemate continues, probably this window opportunity will shut down. So that's what I'm uh, afraid about, yeah. And there's a another question here, and I came across it in a really interesting article you wrote, almost a, a travel article you wrote about visiting this island off, off I suppose, off the, off the coast of China, but also off the coast of Taiwan, uh, Kinmin Island. And this is, it touches on an emotional attachment that China has not just to the Korean War, but also to the DMZ, the demilitarized zone and the separation of the countries. And from, and in many ways, you talk about this island and say for China, this is their DMZ. This is very similar to, the, this is very similar to the one in Korea. It's a relic of the Cold War. It divides um, 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 what is uh, they see as American control from what could potentially be rightly theirs as inside their sphere of, of of influence and there's also loudspeakers tunnels built underneath uh what wire fences up it has all the imagery there so there is a question throughout all of this that goes beyond practicality that china look at not just korea and the korean war but also the separation of countries as part of the cold war as a a deep part of history that they can't just easily relinquish without relinqu relinquishing something of their own history and their own ideology? Well, I think uh, let me answer uh, your question this way, uh, particularly <clears throat> uh, in uh, this uh, Xi Jinping uh, administration period. Um, as we all know, Xi Jinping uh, changed the constitution that, uh, you know, he got rid of the term limits, that means theoretically speaking, he could be a China's leader or China's emperor for you know for a long time, and I think that <clears throat> excuse me, uh, one of the significant reasons that the Chinese Communist Party elites uh, accepted uh, the Xi Jinping's long-term rule uh, that even changed their constitution is that. Uh, Xi Jinping is willing to solve the Taiwan issue under his belt. And I think uh, by particularly uh, by the year 2049, the 100th uh, centenary anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China, my sense is that Xi Jinping is uh, thinking about uh, resolving Taiwan issue, th that is, <coughs> excuse me, unification of uh, you know Taiwan and mainland China much earlier uh, than the year twenty forty nine, because that has to do with the justification of Xi Jinping's uh, getting rid of term limit, and you know that is uh, justifies Xi Jinping's. Uh, rule uh, for a long time. So it has to do with Xi Jinping's legacy as the Chinese leader who reunified, uh, you know, the great re China and achieved the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. Uh, so the Taiwan issue is something that uh, mainly in China, you know, cannot uh, underestimate at all. It is becoming a subject of less and less compromise and uh, uh, coordination or, or uh, discussion uh, with the United States. China will not uh, compromise, particularly on the Xi Jinping when it comes to the China's perceived uh, ownership of the, you know, you know Taiwan. Uh, at the same time, at this uh, particular uh, timing of history, and also if you look at the history, the China has never abandoned North Korea or the Korean Peninsula against outside 
uh, third party uh, superpowers. For example, when uh, uh, you know Japan invaded uh, you know 600 years ago Korean Peninsula, the Ming Dynasty dispatched the soldiers uh, to fight against Japanese to assist uh, you know Korea because they perceived the presence of Japan occupation of Korean Peninsula by Japan as a existential threat against, direct threat against China itself. So 600 years ago, China dispatched its soldiers <clears throat> to uh, drive out uh, Japanese aggression on Korean Peninsula. And during the Korean War, uh, 70 years ago, when U.S. led uh, UN, uh, you know, uh, soldiers uh, came to the Korean Peninsula, and China also dispatched these soldiers uh, to assist uh, you know, the North Korea to drive out what they perceive as outside power, that is the U.S., uh, from the North Korea. So uh, there are some other occasions when in history also that you know, China dispatched soldiers to drive out uh, third party power that tries to occupy the Korean Peninsula. So China sees a, a Korean Peninsula as a strategic uh, uh, backyard that it needs to keep uh, and it needs to control under its uh, sphere of influence. So I think we are entering a period uh, also commensurate with China's increasing rise and its influence. Uh, that China will not give up on Taiwan issue. China will not give up on the North Korean issue. Uh, and that also means that there is a, a lot more room for potential conflict with the United States in the years to come, in the coming years to come as well. So uh, as a final question, and with that in mind, what you just mentioned there with China's strategic interest over the Korean Peninsula, I wonder how you see the future of this playing out, the immediate future, because summits are still very much on the table. They've been discussed a lot and there's encouragement for everyone to return and speak through and not waste the opportunity that seems to be there at the moment. So, but there's also, as you mentioned there, America and China have different ideas and different fundamentally different views for the Korean Peninsula. So how do you see this playing out or how would you ideally have it play out if you had some control over this? Is it simply a return to Trump Kim summits, which of course might, might alienate China? Should we bring China involved in the process to somehow appease them that way? Or is a return perhaps to the six party talks a way to do this? Or um, do you think this might collapse and uh, sanctions might get broken and we may have a return to the bluster and the tests with North Korea perhaps emboldened with China behind them? Well, this is a uh, very uncomfortable question <laughs> uh, because I don't have a very optimistic uh, prediction. The six party talks is uh, dead, even the Chinese side uh, acknowledge it, even though they cannot give up on the narrative because it's diplomatic important the vocabulary they should adhere to. But then practically everyone knows that you know six party talks is that. And uh, what's going to happen from now on? Uh, even though Trump uh, entertains the idea of possibility to have another summit with Kim Jong-un. But if Kim Jong-un doesn't show a sign of willingness to considerably give up nuclear weapons first, I think it's very difficult to, for Trump to field another summit because he will be criticized by his domestic audience and he is facing elections next year. So, and uh, Trump does not want to have so-called bad deal with North Korea. So, my sense is that uh, unlike some other people who see that there is indeed a possibility for another summit, but I'm a little cautiously pessimistic. 
I think the likely scenario for Trump is that Trump will give a lip service to Kim Jong Un. So called, you know, Kim Jong Un is, uh, you know, we are good friend. I'm a good friend of Kim Jong Un. North Korea has a tremendous economic potential if it uh, opens up and yeah, gives up nuclear weapons. Just to engage Kim Jong Un, just to manage Kim Jong Un, so that you know he wants to prevent Kim Jong Un from thinking about or embarking on another major nuclear test that will destroy uh, Trump's so much invested, uh, probably only diplomacy uh, <laughs> by Trump. You know, Trump diplomacy. Trump destroyed every diplomacy. And his only legacy or achievement so far is on the North Korean frontier. So, and uh, this is, uh, Trump has invested so much in the North Korean game, but the election is coming up. So uh, Trump doesn't want to see North Korea uh, conducting another nuclear test. So he will engage, not with actions, but with words uh, to manage Kim Jong-un, at least until the election is over. Another possibility is that if the Democrats use the lack of achievement on nuclear front on the North Korean issue to criticize uh, Trump in the lead up to the elections, then Trump might be tempted to uh, holding another summit uh, with Kim Jong Un just to show that you know I won this game. I know, you know, you know, Kim Jong Un uh, is is you know willing to give up nuclear weapons again, but then I think this you know as I said the likelihood is uh, half and half. So even if that might be an entertaining idea, but there is huge risk for Trump to field another summit with Kim Jong Un unless North Korea completely, surely uh, assures Washington with actions that it's. Uh, committed to uh, denuclearization, which is unlikely. So I think uh, for the immediate uh, uh, coming weeks and months, I think we'll see a likelihood is the continuing uh, stalemate between uh, North Korea and the United States. There are some uh, news stories about the entertaining uh, possible meetings between working level officials uh, between North Korea and the United States. Probably they'll meet somewhere in Switzerland or, or Norway or Sweden, but it's still just the working level contacts, uh, not that much progress. And, uh, and, you know, Kim Jong-un is getting more and more impatient. And uh, he may felt compelled to uh, give more strong signal to the United States so that, you know, he could get the attention of Trump. So those guys will might be also tempted to conduct bigger and much more powerful missiles uh, to get the attention of Washington. That will be a very unfortunate because uh, that will destroy the, you know, the Singapore the whole denuclearization drama. So for the time being, I think we'll see a continuing uh, stalemate uh, and, and between North Korea and the United States. And then we also see a diminishing uh, window of opportunity for denuclearization uh, between uh, 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 North Korea and the United States. So uh, having said that, I think it, what could have happened, what should have happened for the last one year was that both Kim Jong Un and Trump should have put a uh, stage much more bold diplomacy. That is that, you know, Trump should have them showed a, uh, you know, showed a or demonstrated a you know, lifting of partial sanctions as a gesture of goodwill so that North Korea leader could use it to persuade his domestic audience who are skeptical, uh, who are mistrustful of U.S. intentions, given what happened to you know, Libya, Gaddafi. At the same time, 
Kim Jong Un himself, I think Kim Jong Un is also uh, share a due uh, responsibility and blame for the stalemate. Kim Jong Un should have uh, also uh, have a much bolder approach of denuclearization, uh, you know, destroying and showing or inviting inspectors to see. But then I think. Uh, uh, both Kim and Trump surrounded by hawkish advisors. And uh, if you follow the words from the Danish philosopher uh, Kierkegaard, I think both sides, the window of opportunity was open, but they could, take, they could not take the leap of faith to trusting the other side. Uh, they couldn't get over the uh, wall of mistrust that has been there for the last 26 years. They carefully approached the matter. They both hope that the other side uh, take the initiative first so that they could trust the other side. But then, you know, that did not happen. Uh, mistrust came back, still made set up, and window opportunity is, uh, is closing right now. So uh, on that uh, note of, I suppose, quite optimism, but also caution, that is a, a great place to end the podcast on. Um, so it's been <laughs> fascinating. <laughs> I, I am going to link below this podcast uh, some other lectures that uh, Song, Song Hyun has done online and a whole series of articles that I used as research for this podcast. I'm going to link them below. There's a lot more detail in there that I didn't get to. I encourage listeners to go and read them for themselves. So on that, uh, Song Hyun, thanks for coming on the Korean Now podcast. Well, thank you for having me, Chad. It was fun and it also helps me to think aloud uh, in the morning that, you know, what I have been uh, researching for, you know, many, many years. And uh, it was a very, uh, it was a huge topic. Uh, in, but then this kind of opportunity pushes me to think a lot more clear. Uh, so I appreciate this opportunity as well. Thank you, Jed.